This is a DC electric load tester, and it's like some that you've probably seen on AliExpress or Amazon. They're pretty common, and they tend to range from like 150 watt to 180 watt in this case, power dissipation. And I can't even tell you a brand because they're all, uh, there, there's a whole bunch of them that are for sale that all look alike, but uh, all different brands. So if you've seen one of these, you know what I'm talking about. It's got a MOSFET right underneath here, and it's a big heavy duty one. It happens to be an IRFP264. And uh, that's what all the power goes through when you plug it in. And that thing basically switches on and off uh, to a short to basically wear down whatever load you've got in here, whether it's a battery or, or a power supply or whatever. In this case, mine is roasted. Uh, I found the limits of it. This is actually the second one I found the limits of. And you can see uh, I let the smoke out down inside there. So I had a 56 volt battery hooked up. It looks like this. So yeah, a 56 volt battery. I was trying to drain it down to uh, clear a code. I had it running at two amps for quite a while. So two amps, 56 volts nominal. It was somewhere around 100 watts. And that was working fine. And I thought, you know what? This really should be able to take uh, a lot more. So I started slowly cranking it up. And as I was turning the knob, I saw it pass 2.25 amps. And that's where, uh, that's where there were fireworks. And uh, I, I was prepared for it. So I had it running on top of a plate to make sure it didn't, you know, if it, if it caught on fire, it wasn't gonna, you know, burn anything underneath. Fortunately, in this case, there's no burning underneath. Uh, all the uh, all the smoke was let out on top. But 2.2 amps at 56 volts, uh, still underneath what this thing's advertised at. So it really shouldn't have, in my opinion, uh, fried at that level, but realistically, I guess I just need to limit this thing to about 100 watts in the future. But this video is about an attempt to repair this. So I'm gonna take it all apart. I'm gonna take the fan unit off. I'm gonna take the heat sinks off and uh, see if I can replace the MOSFET with uh, something of equal or better spec and see if I can get it working again. So these things are about 45 to $70, depending on where you find them. Um, definitely less expensive than like your more professional grade electric loads, um, but definitely not as capable or well built. So that's what is di dissipating the heat. You've got a heat sink here with some thermal paste and that takes the heat from this MOSFET that's down placed on the bottom of the board and tries to dissipate it through the fans. So I'll take the MOSFET off. Well, first I'm gonna clean this up and then I'll uh, desolder the MOSFET and we'll see what we've got. So I carefully but fairly aggressively clean this off with a toothbrush and isopropyl alcohol. And you can see all that gritty stuff there where probably the board got a little bit burnt, but I was happy to see that it looks like these other components, I don't know if they're diodes or other MOSFETs or what those are exactly, but those look okay. And mainly just the big power MOSFET is damaged here. You can see a little bit of copper down below. So some of the mask was burnt off. But anyways, I'm gonna take this MOSFET off now. It's gonna be difficult. The whole thing is designed to dissipate heat. So I think I'll blow air on the back while I use my um, hot soldering tip on the front. We'll see how that goes. This actually is so far eating pretty easily. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah, no problem at all. So the legs were actually fried on two of them, actually all three of them. Or maybe, yeah, I think the legs were actually broken on all three, because I think they all three bend and go through the board. It can be really challenging to solder, or in this case, remove solder, on boards like this that are built for heat dissipation because your soldering iron, you know, it's like it really has to heat up the whole board before it can uh, melt the solder. I finished cleaning the board as best I can and as you can see, it doesn't look pretty. A bit of the mask and the copper layer underneath it has been burned off right here and we have this kind of loose uh, pad that's left behind. If I flip it over, you can see it's also kind of a loose pad on the back. However, that pad just doesn't really go anywhere here. It just ends right here. So I'm not so worried about how it looks on the back, but on the front, that pad leads to uh, this big panel right here, ultimately leading down to these two links, which jump over to um, another side of the board. I know that they're soldered into the board, and if needed, I can actually run a jumper wire from one of these up to the MOSFET leg once it's soldered in, so I'm not relying on this little pad. 
The other thing that's going to be a problem is just contact between the MOSFET and this board. I think that the board is designed to uh, dissipate quite a lot of heat as well as the actual heat sink which uh, presses down on the back of the MOSFET. So I actually want the MOSFET to touch the board completely. I think the way that I can accomplish that is by putting thermal paste down on the board, the same stuff that I'll put on the back of the MOSFET uh, to connect to the heat sink. There is reason to be optimistic though. Um, the original MOSFET, here it is. If you see it at just the right angle, it's an IRF P260. And that's a fairly common old MOSFET from International Semiconductor, I believe. And it's possible to still buy them. So, well, I should say it's possible to buy a 260N fairly, fairly easily. So I found this IRFP 260N. You can buy it on DigiKey or any of the normal electronic sites and sometimes even Amazon. As best as I can tell, this is the new generation of the IRFP 260. So different manufacturing methods, um, per perhaps a little bit more precise, but others say it's a little, li little bit less robust as well. We're just gonna have to try it and see how it goes. So let's attach the MOSFET into position, then put some thermal paste down, then fold the MOSFET down, then maybe hold it down while I melt the solder so that it can sit all the way down where it wants to naturally sit. And then I'll run a jumper from this leg over to here so that we have full power transferring capability. And now we have to insert the MOSFET through these holes and keep in mind that it's got to have to fold over to be flat once it's soldered. So I'm going to lay it in place where it finally needs to be first. You kind of just get an estimation in my mind for where those legs need to fold. So I know that's a little bit, a little bit down from where this uh, natural stop is. And I just need to kind of tack the center one. And then I can let it cool and solder the outer ones. And now I'm going to finish solder all three of these. Make sure it goes all the way around. We'll check the other side as well. Okay, now I'm gonna come up with a, well now I think I'm going to lean it down and get some thermal paste underneath it. So this will be kind of interesting. Here's a bit of thermal paste, heat sink compound. So I'm just gonna use a screwdriver to try to lay some down in there uh, underneath the area where the top of the MOSFET is gonna interact with the circuit board. The idea is just to um, help make up for that area where the copper coating and the uh, circuit board mask is uh, is missing. And um, I mean, ultimately, this thing's busted as is. So if this makes it work, great. If it doesn't, well, no worse off. So I'm just going to try to give it every chance that I can to try to dissipate heat effectively. And uh, that's where this stuff comes in. Okay, so at this point, now I should be able to fold the MOSFET down. And if I've done everything right, it'll kind of fall into its uh, original position, which actually is marked here on the board. Yeah, hopefully that's good. Obviously it has a little bit of margin of error as well. Okay, that'll ultimately get held down by the heat sink. Uh, next thing I want to do is run the jumper that goes from this weak contact pad over to uh, something more substantial. Here's a little piece of wire with silicone insulation, which is really good for um, high heat uh, resistance, so I can solder the snot out of it. And it'll fit right between the weak pad there on the MOSFET and this more substantial connection down below, just like that. So I've stripped off just a little bit at each end, and I'm going to pre-tin that and then try to get some but a big old glob of solder down there so that it's easy to connect on that end, and then it should drop right onto the uh, to the pad on this end. So this could be not my prettiest work, but I think I can make it work. So here's my little jumper wire, pre-fluxed. And let's now pre-tin it with a little bit of solder on both of those ends. Now let's see if we can get a little, uh, little solder to stick to the bottom. All right, so blobs have been affixed to both of these. And of course we have a decent blob over there already. Now let's connect between the two. Okay, so now we'll insert the jumper from one to the other location. I think I'm just gonna drop the, the wires for this jumper. I'm just gonna drop between these two posts. So we get the advantage of um, 
you know, conductivity from both of them. Here's why I love the silicone insulation. It's not backing up. It's not, um, you know, pulling back like normal, normal insulation likes to do. So with that connection done, we'll make the other connection here on the, on the MOSFET side. Hopefully this is a one-time repair because it's going to get a little harder to do this each time. So now we've got a great connection um, from basically the other end of this trace, this big huge panel type trace that the MOSFET was attached to. Just skipping from one end of it to the other with a wire jumper, a significantly oversized wire jumper. But before I put it all back together, I do want to clean it one last time. So I'm just going to use some IPA, clean that up. And I guess I could get a Q-tip and get all crazy about it, but A for effort here at least, right? Okay, now we need to think about the thermal junction between this big old heat sink and the back of the FET. So I'll put some more of that paste on there. I'm just going to squirt a bunch of it on there because the downside of it squeezing out doesn't seem like any sort of problem, but the downside of not having it make good contact, uh, big problem. So we'll hook one side, kind of scoot it into place, give an estimation for where it should drop down, and we'll kind of bend it down and hook the other. It feels nice and slidey, so that's a good sign. Yeah, we are hooked in. So from the side view, you can see how the sink is now right on top of our new FET. That looks pretty good, as good as I can make it. And uh, now we'll plug in the, the fan jumper. And what's left is just to try this sucker out. I'm gonna start obviously as low and slow as I can, but uh, we're gonna kinda just find out how this goes. Okay, it's time to test this thing. So, got the knobs all the way down. All right, I'm gonna plug in power to the board, see what happens when I just give it that much. Okay, board's powered up. Let's, um, interesting that it says 0.01 amps. Let's do the uh, clearing process. Odd that it's, oh, there we go, now it's zero. Okay, so we're all zeroed out. And I'm gonna use my power supply. And um, let's see here, I'm gonna turn things all the way down. Let's just start with 12 volts. And we'll just give it um, 100 milliamp, 100 milliamp backstop um, to stop things. If things go awry, this will limit it to uh, 100 milliamps of awry, I guess. All right, nothing to do but just plug it together. Okay, no fire so far. All right, so now I'm going to, um, let's give it a little bit more voltage. Not too much because otherwise, well, let's take it all the way up and let's see if there's any uh, arcing problems just from this alone. Okay, it can handle 50 volts. That's a good, that's good news. Let's take it back down to 24. I like 24 because this is a 12 volt power supply internally, and then this is a buck boost converter that's boosting 12 volts all the way up. And so when it's boosting to 50 volts, it can't really do much for current. So we've got the current limited at um, 100 milliamps. Let's set that to 200 and see if we can actually dial up a little bit of current over here. So I'll stop as soon as I see just the slightest amount showing. This will tell us if it even works at all. There it is. It went too far and it, the power supply limited things. Let's use the uh, fine adjustment. Yeah. Hey, all right. We're passing current and measuring, showing a measurement. That's good. So three and a half watts. Great. Uh, let's turn this up a little bit more. Set the limit up to one amp. Oh boy, so let's turn it all the way up to, uh, I guess we'll do one amp at 24 volts, but slowly see when the fan turns on. There's the fan. Okay, great. So we're showing, uh, we have a limitation of one amp over here, which is not gonna be the same as one amp uh, passing through it over here. 
but we can inch up on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm hitting the limit. So that's 20 watts, just about 20 watts over here. And the temperature, 28C, that's good. 29C, I expect it to creep up, but um, that's not excessive or anything. Let's just go and allow two amps. Two amps is where I had it before, although it was on 55, 56 volts. And two amps, um, two amps worked okay. I was when I went to two and a quarter that things went awry. There's one amp. Can we go to two? Well, there's one and a half. Let's let it sit there for a little bit. You can see it's pulling my power supply down to 20 volts. So uh, 20 volts, one and a half amps, close to three watts. So far so good. I think what we're gonna have to do is just go ahead and test it on high voltage again. All right, here's that same 56 volt battery that likes to give it trouble. Um, let's see, I guess we'll start just knobs all the way down. We'll start by just plugging in. We'll just have to see how it goes. I'm gonna be ready to pull these apart if there are fireworks. Okay, so far so good. Let's turn it up slowly to uh, one amp. Okay, we're doing one amp all right. Let's just leave it there and see what happens to our uh, temperature as measured there. So it's been holding a little over 60 watts for a minute now, and that demonstrates to me that it is fixed. Uh, we repaired it with a couple little modifications and at this point, it is working, but I'm afraid to take it up much higher just because I know that these things are limited. This is a pretty useful tool, but it's not a lab grade, you know, high power device. In the past, I saw it fail at 2.25 amps, and uh, I'm afraid to go anywhere near that. But I would like to see if it could at least do one and a half. Is it worth it? Well, Yes, it is, because otherwise I'll just never know what my limitation is. If it can do one and a half amps at 50 volts, I think I'm happy with that. That's something like 75 watts, depending on the exact level of charge in the battery. Nope, that's it. <laughs> well, I guess we found the limit. 1.17 amps is where it was happy, and then things fell apart. Darn it. <laughs> well, that was exciting. All right, well, hopefully this has been helpful to anybody that has one of these and uh, runs into a bit of fireworks like I just saw and wants to give it a repair. I've shown you how you can do that. I've also shown you that it may be futile. But in any case, thanks for watching. Good luck with this. Hit the like button if you're so inclined and uh, stay safe out there. Thanks for watching.